Well, first off, most trailers don't have any lighting at all, which is really problematic. You're right. I, I see, I think in the future that they'll all be lit. Uh, I think uh, that this invention here is a, a step in that direction. Welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. In this episode, we are going to talk about lighting. It is now October. The days are getting shorter. The nights are getting longer. Lighting is a issue this time of year. Interior lighting in trailers is an ongoing challenge, especially when the trailer is disconnected from the tractor. And so I wanted to share with you a interview that we did with a client of ours, SSR Lighting Solutions. Now, this interview originally aired in 2023. So when you hear me talk about 2023, no, I haven't forgotten what year it is. Um, it's just that we recorded it last year, but it's just as relevant in 2024 and beyond. So for those of you who've not heard the interview, this will be the first time you're hearing it. For those of you that are regular listeners of the show, it's been over a year, so it'll be good for you to hear that again. I really like this interview because we talk about the problem. We go into detail about that. And he also goes into some real detail about the engineering that went into this innovative product. So I think it'll be good for all of us to listen to that again. I hope you enjoy the interview. I'm very happy to have my guest with me today. My guest is Daryl Grady. He's the Director of Engineering of SSR Lighting Solutions. Daryl is a shareholder and heads up the R&D development at SSR Lighting Solutions. His career began in automotive. We won't hold that against him because now he's really motivated on trying to help heavy duty. So we're very happy to have Daryl on the show. Daryl, welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. Hey, thanks for having me. And welcome to being heavy duty. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about lighting. You know, I remember many years ago, and unfortunately, this is like 20 plus years ago, when all of a sudden the LED light became a reality. And I remember, you know, talking to fleets about getting the LED tail light so that the the light would show up faster and people would respond to it quicker and there'd be less rear end collisions. Like this is going back 20 plus years. LED has been around for quite a while in the industry and yet we still have issues related to lighting and uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. So talk to me a little bit about where we are right now in 2023 as it uh, relates to lighting, semi-trucks and trailers and uh, the trucking industry. Inside of the trailer, is, as far as LED lighting is concerned, we do see trailers that have LEDs uh, in the ceiling. But when you do see those, the LED mounts, they have to be modified in such a way to, to have them installed. So they have brackets on the outside of them that are made to, to hold them in place and riveted in place. And then, of course, the entire delivery system of the voltage and amperage is something that isn't even tailored to the trailer at all. So you just have these lights that are installed and then the trunk cable that runs down the side is just, uh, everything is aftermarket. It isn't an actual complete device that is uh, made specifically for inside the semi-trailer. Is that because there is a bit of an attitude towards trailers, like they're just a box on wheels. And so when fleets are specking them new, they're not requesting this. And then, and then it becomes an afterthought where they think, well, maybe we need it. So they have to add it, uh, you know, in the aftermarket. Is that how that happens? Or like, why are we in this situation in 2023? I think it's because an, an actual entire kit was just never um, up until this point uh, addressed and invented. I'm running into people that it's been a constant need. But when you do install it in a aftermarket scenario, you're collecting pieces. So it, it becomes an arduous task. Therein lies the biggest problem up to this point. Why would a fleet want to go to the extra cost of adding this lighting inside of a trailer? Like, I think we all understand the importance of headlights and taillights and marker lights and things like that. But, but why would a fleet look at this and say, you know what, this is an investment that's worthwhile because it's actually going to create a positive impact for us. Walk me through that. So it's, that's, that's an interesting question because as we were doing this kit, inventing this kit, uh, the, we first got involved in it uh, from an automotive, with our background, of course, uh, but uh, from a safety standpoint. Right. Um, Ford had a couple incidences of a worker being injured while inspecting a trailer. 
there was a, a large piece of wood in, uh, projecting at such an angle that uh, it actually entered the person's leg. And um, that happened because they could not see. So despite the fact that there's a dock light at the back of the trailer, uh, once a person or somebody enters the trailer, all it really does is illuminate your, the back of the person or, or the, the forklift. So that happened. And then immediately or not long after that, somebody actually fell off the side of a trailer uh, wow. because trailers, as you know, uh, now are all composite down the side. So the large rivets had been sheared and the forklift went in with a load of racks and to kind of straighten it up on the side as they do. They kind of use the side of the trailer to to get things squared. And he went out the side of the trailer. So even though the trailer was inspected, that was missed. So that is how we originally got involved with the lighting system. So they they made a request that um, the lighting system be invented uh, for safety and inspection reasons. What we found is as we were doing it, um, other reasons came to bear. People with multi-stop shipments needed to read labels. We have a customer that services rock and roll shows. So they have our lights in the trailer because people are entering the trailer with their hands full and uh, they need to be seeing inside the trailer without turning on on and off switches. And then also um, the, the dropped aspect, the other thing we had to invent was illuminating the trailer when it's separated from the tractor. There are light systems out there that, there are no light systems that do that, but there are light systems that allow you to plug them in. But of course you can imagine the dangers of somebody going out with an extension cord around a, a dock situation. The businesses wanted to do away with that liability. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, safety is something that unfortunately there, I mean, I don't think that everybody uh, thinks this way, but there's certain people who think this way. They're like, it's just extra cost. It's almost like, you know, they resist it because it's like, it's almost like they're, they're resisting it, like paying an insurance bill or something. They just don't want to spend the money. But at the end of the day, if you've ever run a business where people can get injured, you know that once they get injured, any money you save disappears and a lot more goes out trying to offset that situation. So safety is an investment, but it's an investment that has a positive return on investment pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and we were also looking into that, that cost investment. And, and so we wanted to make a device that could be resellable. So once it's installed in the trailer, that is a, a positive that the trailer has this lighting system in it. So that, that charge could be implemented during resale. Uh, also, the fiberglass type trailers are more expensive to buy and harder to get rid of. Uh, this is a solution for that too. So one of our potential customers we're in talks with now, Ashley Furniture, is actually looking at this system instead of buying their normal fiberglass roofed trailers for for those reasons. Also, if any damage happens to a fiberglass roof trailer, it's 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 much more of a hassle than the the standard skinned trailer. So when you were developing this solution, what kind of voice of the customer did you engage in? Like how did you how did you work with the fleets and the commercial trucking industry to uncover potential pitfalls as you were putting it the product together? Uh, the biggest one that uh, w- was the challenge right out of the gate was a uh, make me a, a lighting system where I can drop the trailer and I don't have to plug it in. So so that led of course to a, a battery situation. And then you have to think, where do I put the battery and what kind of space do I have to deal with? So we decided to put it in the nose of the trailer behind the, what's normally plywood in the nose. And so that's a, a I have a the device right here. And you can see how thin that is. And inside of there is not only the battery, but a voltage regulator, a charging regulator, the charger pickups. So it can be run by solar or the truck or by itself. And so that's that's the entire apparatus right there. For those that are listening that aren't watching this, it's about the size of a tablet uh, in in you know surface area, but it's probably what about three inches thick? Uh, not even. So it's just yeah, just under that actually. And so that's the standard uh, size of of a uh, semi trailer. So we had to make sure that it could be retrofitted into any existing trailer. And of course, if it's being installed in the manufacturing level, that it meant that or complied with all the uh, manufacturers as well. You know, I'm always fascinated to talk to people who engineer products because I, I want to learn how they went through the process. So trailers, I mean, sometimes they're in blistering heat. Sometimes they're in really, really cold. And we all know batteries that, that when they lose their charge, they don't do well in the cold. So how did you address the uh, environmental changes that all these trailers are going to go through? And then also trailers will sit for a long time sometimes without being used. And then they're all of a sudden they're 
they're sprung into service again. So how did you address those issues? And the battery itself too has to be a non-spillable. So it is a glass mat battery and it, it is specifically designed. Um, so we, we've had actual trailers with the kits on the road now for a little over four years to address those problems and to take readings. So there's, there's tests we can do that in the automotive market where the tests are supposed to simulate you know, two years of, of whatever, discharging and charging. Like to accelerate it so you don't have to wait two years, right? Well, those are great tests, but nothing is, is as good as actually being out on the road. So so we went yeah. through um, quite a, a, a bit of um, adjustments in, to address what you're talking about. But the, the biggest one that we found was not allowing the battery to discharge uh, below yeah. 10 volts. And, and that's important. So uh, the battery has a regulator inside of it that once it gets to 10 volts, the whole system shuts off and it, it will not allow itself to turn back on until it's hooked to the tractor again. And then once it's hooked to the tractor again, it'll run off the tractor and also the battery charger will kick in and eventually it'll go to its full charge. Now, when it's fully charged, all the lights in the trailer can stay on continuously for over four hours. But to, to allow that to go even further, what we've done and I guess some people can't see this, they can just hear, but each, this is a, a light, one of the lights, and there's there's eight in a kit. Each light has a motion sensor. So the entire kit stays on. There is no on off switch. It's always on. So if you walk near this light, it turns on, but it only stays on for approximately about four minutes, maybe a little longer, and then it turns off. So if you're just working in a specific area of the trailer, only those lights will stay lit. If you remove yourself completely from the trailer for over four minutes, the entire kit will shut off. So even though we say the kit will stay lit constantly for a little over four hours, it's actually much longer than that because the kit is regulating itself to only be lit when somebody is actually in need of the light. That's fantastic. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Are you deferring maintenance because of filter cost or availability? Or worse yet, are you trading down to no-name filters to try to save a few bucks? Either way, you're rolling the dice. The good news, there's a new premium filter option for fleets, Hanks Filtration. If you're responsible for a fleet, you won't believe how much using Hanks filters will save you. But you've got to go to heavydutypartsreport.com slash Hanks to find out more. That's heavydutypartsreport.com slash H-E-N-G-S-T. Head there now. At Diesel Laptops, they go way beyond diagnostic tools. They are your complete shop efficiency partner. From diesel technician training to complete repair information, parts lookup tools, and robust technical support, they are there to support you every step of the way. Learn more and download your free starter pack today by visiting diesellaptops.com. That's diesellaptops.com. HCA Truck Pride is the heart of the independent parts and service channel. They have 750 parts stores and 450 service centers conveniently located across the U.S. and Canada. Visit heavydutypartsreport.com slash HDA Truck Pride today to find a location near you. Again, that's heavydutypartsreport.com slash HDA Truck Pride and let the heart of the independent service channel take care of your commercial equipment. We're back from our break. Before the break, Daryl, thanks for talking a little bit about the situation with trailers, interior lighting, safety. We think about uh, the the LED technology that's been around for a really long time, and this is just a problem that just hadn't been addressed yet. And you've done a really good job of describing some of the aspects of this product that you're developing. Maybe you could take a moment to describe to us kind of in more detail the way that trailers are currently lit and and why it's problematic. I know you mentioned it before, but I'd like a little more detail on that. Well, first off, most trailers don't have any lighting at all, which is really problematic. You're right. I, I see, I think in the future that they'll all be lit. Uh, I think uh, that this invention here is a, a step in that direction. And maybe down the line, there'll be other kits offered. But I, I see in the future that they all will be. And in a dock situation right now, we're still, after decades, still using the lamp that's attached to the dock itself, the building that that swings around and shines into the trailer. And even though that can illuminate a trailer when you're standing on the dock looking into the trailer, you can see fine. The problem is, is the minute you step into the trailer or you take a forklift or product into the trailer, 
it's just illuminating your back. So it, it, you, it immediately just becomes a giant shadow. So the fact that we've been dealing with that technology for decades is, is kind of mind boggling. Although, as, as we mentioned before, even though the LED has been invented, there were some, the conditions inside of a trailer are so violent uh, from day to day that um, a way to harness the LED and keep it safe in that environment has been a while coming. And it's finally here. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more about that. You know, in the testing for this product, no doubt you looked at all these different environments. But talk to me a little bit about the temperature at the roof of a trailer and how that was a, a real problem you had to overcome. Yes. Um, so you can imagine a trailer spends time. It could be in Lubbock, Texas, all the way to Minneapolis, Minnesota. So these trailers go through in huge temperature swings and the materials on the, the roof of the trailer. Also, you can imagine expanding and contracting constantly. And so when we were first uh, trying to put LEDs onto the roof of the trailer, we had some catastrophic failures as, uh, but those were all learning experiences for us. We wanted to pull data off of that. And uh, finally, so what, what we had to do is, um, if, I know some people can't see this, they're just listening, but we had to lift the actual control board off of the ceiling uh, enough and put a, a big enough heat sink between the ceiling and the light itself to keep that safe in all of those conditions. And uh, it took us a while to get to the right mix because, of course, the other challenge is, is the light can't stick down beyond the roof bows. Otherwise, they'd be damaged. So you have to keep it at a uh, certain thin aspect to it, and but also be able to achieve the heat sinking. And it took a while, but we got there. There's a, a couple other interesting things, if I can, too. Uh, each light has a voltage regulator in it. So the light at the front of the trailer is the same luminosity as the light in the back of the trailer. That is another thing that you run into when you're trying to make a uh, amperage and voltage travel a 53 foot trailer. The light closest to the power source is brighter than the light that's in the back of the trailer. Of course, we had to address that by voltage regulating each light. So when you go into one of our trailers, it is a consistent light all the way throughout. Right. And, and, and it's, you know, you just think to yourself, oh, let's put some lights in a trailer. Like it should be easy. Right, and and right. yet you find out, no, wait a minute. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of math and a lot of science that needs to go into this. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and to, to um, endure the violence that happens in, inside of a, you know, you can imagine what it's like is it's going down the road at uh, 70 miles an hour, you know, hitting, bouncing around, going into docks, all the temperature changes. Uh, the moisture changes, that's uh, another thing we had to address is make sure everything was watertight. I, I think one of the, the crowning achievements, though, is making sure no matter who installed it, it would be installed correctly. That was uh, that was a thing that we had to labor on intensively is to make sure no matter who installed it, it would be in such a way that it would not allow you to do it incorrectly. <laughs> so yeah. that was a good one. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love learning about this. And and as we said, there's a lot of science that, that goes into it, a lot of math, but um, there's also some unique challenges when you're making products for heavy duty. So for example, with a class eight trailer, you've got forklifts running in and out of them all day long. What kind of hurdles did you have to overcome when you were developing the product and you were thinking about, okay, how do we make this work with forklifts zipping in and out of the trailer daily? Well, there, there's three things that come to mind right away as, as you were saying that. Uh, first off, uh, the box itself, making sure that it was placed in the nose of the trailer in such a way where a forklift punching through the front of the trailer would not destroy the box. So the, the box is the size it is and easily placed high up on the wall behind that plywood. So even if a forklift were to pierce its forks through the nose of the trailer, it's fine. Second was if inevitably there's going to be a forklift that goes through the roof of the trailer. You can't stop that. So we made the trunk in cable uh, or in sections, the trunk cable in sections. So when that happens, you don't have to replace the whole light kit. You can just replace a portion of it if the trunk cable gets damaged. Also, will all the lights still work after a forklift takes out one or two of them? Yes. So we made sure we addressed that. But this one was, <laughs> was a real pain for me was the on off switch. No matter <laughs> where I put an on off switch, it was inside the trailer. It was, it was getting damaged. Uh, I was, um, using, uh, just passive touch switches like your mouse pad, uh, that thin. And, uh, I just could not prevent, uh, no matter where I put it, a forklift was going to get it. So eventually we moved to the, uh, the motion sensor and just leaving the kit on all the time. 
And and little beknownst to us, because we were just thinking in automotive terms, that ended up being a big sell, for example, the truck and roll people that uh, do the, the the rock concerts, because those guys are going in on the trailers with their arms full all the time. They don't they can't reach over and and turn on a, a, a lighting system. They want to just walk in and have it turn on. So but those three come to mind right away for forklift problems. <laughs> right. And I can imagine mounting it would have been interesting. Like if you just use bolts or something, wouldn't that just like shear them off as uh, every time? Yeah. If you step inside a, a well-used trailer, there's nothing but marks all the way up and down the, the entire side. And even automotive trailers that have a, a plank of thick steel, right? When you first go in the trailer, because it's just uh, from hitting the dock plate, they're constantly hitting the roof of the trailer. So yeah, the automotive uh, racks, actually most industry racks are made to cube out. They want to get the most out of a trailer that they can. So their racking systems are going to go from floor to ceiling, which doesn't allow a forklift driver a lot of room for error. You know, that's, it's just the way it is. So now that you have the product in the market, this is something that you mentioned could be retrofitted to existing trailers. What is the, the, the process that they have to go through to do the retrofit? Roughly, how long does it take? Can an average technician do it? Is there any special instructions they need to think about? So anyone can visit our website and on the website is the actual installation manual. So anyone can mm-hmm. visit that. And um, that's an interesting question. It, the way it's presented on our website, I would say two people would take about two hours. However, that is, uh, we've presented the cleanest, neatest installation. So, uh, always thinking in the automotive realm with, uh, you know, the big automotive racks and the, and the forklift drivers going in and out of there. In that installation, you see no wires whatsoever. So, so the, the wires from, from the lights and, uh, the trunk cable going down the trailer. We've, uh, we give you instructions how to actually install that. So when you look up at the trip, at the finished product, all you see are lights. Now, uh, different people have different needs. So if, uh, you just wanted to tape the wire up there and just have the lights, of course, you could probably do the entire thing by yourself in 30 minutes. We, we went to the craziest scenario and then you can just work your way backward from there. Right. But a couple hours to retrofit the whole trailer. I think that's a pretty reasonable time frame. And. Now, what about serviceable parts and and replacement parts? So over time, things wear out, right? LEDs, the diodes burn out, batteries need to be replaced. They just don't hold the charge anymore. So what is the availability on service parts? And and you brought up a a good point there too. So um, this is the lights and and, uh, the lights has just a a simple plug in here that can only go one way. That's important too. So if somebody's doing an installation, there's no wrong way to do it. It only allows you to plug it in one way. If one light were to get damaged or need to be replaced, the rest of the lights still work. It's been addressed in such a way that, so let's say some damage happens to a section, you just uh, order one light from us and we'll send it to you and you can you can replace that. We've also taken the main trunk cable and put that into three sections. So let's say something catastrophic happens just in the area of the trailer. You don't have to buy a whole kit. Uh, the battery, four screws and the lid opens, two terminals, it's, it's that easy. And everything is uh, warranted for two years. But like you said, eventually, I would expect the battery to be the first thing that uh, starts to go on a ramp down as far as um, is holding its charge and, and that can easily re- be replaced. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've put a lot of thought and effort into making this as easy as possible. And it's so important because, you know, people's uh, safety, their their bodily, you know, you don't, you don't want to have people having bodily harm come to them just because they're there doing their job. And so I love the fact that, you know, it's easy to install, easy to service. That means it's going to work and, and it's going to be there when you need it to be there, which is great. Typically in like a 53 foot trailer, how many uh, light fixtures do you end up installing in addition to the battery pack and the main trunk cable? With the 53 foot trailer, we found the, the number to be eight. Each light has a output greater than a 100 watt bulb. That seems to be the standard. When, when people ask me questions about brightness, they always want it measured against the 100 watt bulb. So it, they're brighter than a 100 watt bulb. So imagine eight of those inside right. of a 53 foot van trailer. You have no problem reading. It's, it's much like an office. It, that's what it reminds me of. Like you're just sitting in your office when, when that happens. We also chose eight because the entire package draws just over one amp at that point. And thus you get the long hours out of the battery when it's, when it's dropped from the tractor. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So Daryl, 
who is your ideal customer so far? Have you been working with a lot of little independent fleets? You work with the big mega carriers. Like, who do you find be, are the ones that have been adopting this uh, this product quickly? Actually, surprisingly, both. So uh, our ideal customer, uh, we we really don't have one. Uh, we've actually well, you got to own a class eight trailer. <laughs> yeah, right, right. so we've actually talked to Amazon, for example, and uh, we're in talks uh, with them right now. Uh, so I mean, ideally for for a first customer, that would be fantastic. But uh, we've also got lights installed in a couple fleets where they only have four trailers. In in fact, one of those customers, I'm very grateful we had early on because they operate out of Flint, Michigan on a multi-stop basis. So they actually uh, they were a great test bed for us because if it could survive in that environment, you know, that was a, a great R&D thing for us. So he was, he was a big help, not only a customer, but uh, we really relish the ability to be involved in that fleet. So Daryl, let's talk a little bit about the future. What's the big dream for this product? Um, I think this product or, or product like it, I think that uh, eventually all semi-trailers, all of them, uh, right out of the manufacturer, are going to be lit. It's it's not even going to be an option because I think the the need for it, uh, especially as we touched uh, on the safety and the liability aspect of things from the humanistic standpoint, I, I think it needs to happen. We've already achieved a way to make it easy to be part of the manufacturing process. There isn't hard, there's hardly any modification that would need to be done at all. If you wanted to hide the wires completely, the roof bows would need a, a simple hole added because the, the roof bows that go across the trailer are already hollow. 90% of it is already made for this to happen. So I, I, I suspect in the not too distant future that uh, this kit or, or a kit like it is, is going to be everywhere. One of the best ways to get the manufacturers to do anything is to have some fleet start specking it. And they're like, where do I get this from? And they tell you. <laughs> so so hopefully some fleets are listening right now. We know that they are. We know some big fleets listen and, and they've actually adopted some of the recommendations of guests of this show. I have confirmation on that. And we know the OEMs are listening as well. So hopefully this uh, helps those uh, people all come together. Yeah, well, you know, I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the heavy duty industry, right? We we need new players to come in and, and look at things from different perspectives, leverage different uh, technologies, and bring great new products to the industry. So, you know, from all of us, thank you very much for your efforts on this. It sounds like this is going to be a very successful product for you. I think so as well. I think there's a real need for it in the marketplace. And and thank you for having us. Thank you. You've been listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin, and we've been speaking with Daryl Grady. He's the Director of Engineering at SSR Lighting Solutions. And if you'd like to learn more about this specific product for Heavy Duty, go to SSRLightingSolutions.com. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Daryl Grady from SSR Lighting Solutions. As I mentioned, they are a client of the Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation. We're very happy to be working with them. There's going to be opportunities for you if you are a distributor to sell this product in the North American market. So make sure that you reach out to them as soon as possible. It's time for That's Not Heavy Duty. In this edition of That's Not Heavy Duty, I wanted you to consider the pros and cons of custom lighting on big rigs. Now, uh, in the show notes, we're going to share the link to this entire video. It's about eight to nine minutes long. It's from ET Transport, where they go into their opinions, at least one of their drivers goes into their opinion about uh, the pros and cons of, of customizing your lighting on a big rig. But in that discussion, he mentions that truckers should be able to customize their trucks and that there are differences in laws between the US and Canada. But then he makes an interesting statement. He says that you know sometimes the fine for custom lighting or for even tinting of windows is like a hundred bucks. And he basically says that truckers should just do what they want to do, uh, customize their trucks the way they want. And if they get a fine here or there, it's really not that big in the grand scheme of things. It's not that much money in the grand scheme of things. So instead of me telling you what's heavy duty and what's not, I wanted to ask you your opinion. Is this heavy duty? Is this the way we should approach things? Uh, should law enforcement just back off on custom lighting? Is it okay for truckers to just put the lighting they want? and pay the fines and just move on. What do you think? I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments. Now you can reach out to us in several ways. One, 
on social media, especially on LinkedIn. That's where we spend a lot of our time. Uh, two, you can put the comment in the YouTube video for this episode. Or three, you can go to the show notes on your podcast player and click the text button and text us. We'd love to hear your thoughts on whether or not this is heavy duty. If you're listening to this episode on the day that it dropped, which is October 14th, 2024, I am in Florida this week at the MEMA Tech Conference. Now, this is a big honor for me. Uh, First of all, I'm getting the opportunity to moderate several uh, of the panel discussions. So I'm going to be moderating three sessions. One is a mentoring session for startup finalists because they've got a startup competition. Uh, Two, I'm going to be moderating a panel on AI, how it's a reality in the aftermarket. And I'm going to be moderating a panel on heavy-duty e-commerce data standards. In addition to that, I'm also going to be a judge for the MEMA Aftermarket Startup Challenge, and I'm mentoring one of the six finalists. If you are interested in this, uh, stay tuned to our socials on LinkedIn. I'm going to be posting some videos and some content uh, from my attendance of the show. And uh, if you want to participate in next year's Startup Challenge, make sure you head over to Mima and check out the Tech Startup Challenge. It is going to be awesome. Thank you for listening and watching our program. We really appreciate your ongoing support. If you haven't already, head over to heavydutypartsreport.com, hit the follow button and sign up to our weekly email. You get one email a week, no spam, just one email a week tells you all of our new content. Also, if you like to listen on the podcast player of your choice, Take a moment and follow for free. And if it gives you the option, please give us a five-star rating and review. We would really appreciate that. I've heard that helps us with our reach. And finally, on YouTube, if you like watching the video versions of our program, hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so you never miss out. Thank you again for your ongoing support. And as always, I want to encourage you to be heavy duty. Thank you for watching this video. Click here to subscribe to the Heavy Duty Parts Report YouTube channel and click here to watch another great episode.